It's Wednesday, June 12th. The college baseball season continues, but of course Arkansas season is over. The Razorbacks out here in their home regional for the second year in a row. We'll talk about that today on the Whole Hog Baseball Podcast. We'll also talk about the other things we've seen in this year's NCAA tournament. But first, a word from our sponsor. Kendall King, where it's all about teamwork. Building brands around a design concept, Kendall King takes pride in their skill sets and displays and signing, as well as dot-com photography, content creation, and influencer marketing. The bases are loaded, and the Kendall King team is bringing it home. This is the Whole Hog Baseball Podcast, presented by Kendall King, the first podcast devoted entirely to Arkansas baseball, featuring insight from Arkansas baseball color analyst Bubba Carpenter. Here's your host, Matt Jones. And we welcome you to our final podcast of 2024. Matt Jones with Bubba Carpenter here in our Fayetteville studio. Of course, Arkansas with a, a, a disappointing end to its 2024 season, losing in its home regional. It felt a lot like the year before when TCU came in here. And you know, this year it was K-State. There's something about purple teams from the Big 12 coming into bomb. I, I think they, they've they got to love that, If it, maybe if they see Fayetteville on their regional selection next year. But, Bubba, th- there are a lot of similarities, I think, between what happened last year and this year. And then there are some differences. I mean, you know, last year – they did battle their way back into the regional championship game. This year, they didn't do that. They lost to SEMO. I just feel like, you know, we knew TCU was a really good team coming in last year. Um, they'd been on a roll before they came to Fayetteville. You didn't see that from these teams coming in this year. Yeah, you, you know, Louisiana Tech was like 8-2 and two in its last 10, and they didn't play well at the regional. SEMO uh, was kind of the same way. K-State, I think they were 5-5 five and five coming in. This one really surprised me a lot more than last year. Yeah, same here. When, when I saw the the – the regional picks, I I felt really good about it. To be honest with you, I overlooked K State. Like when I was doing my research, I kind of looked at them and I'm like, ah, oh, and I kind of put them aside. Mm-hmm. I looked at Louisiana Tech and I thought, you know what, Simo, they they can swing it, but they're not going to have the pitching to shut us down. So, you know, I thought they might score some runs, but I didn't think, uh, you know, I, I no one, I don't think anyone saw this coming. To be mm-hmm. honest with you, um, now, you know, we'll probably break down games in a minute, but. I still think that the game with Hagen Smith was kind of fluky. Mm-hmm. You know, Phil Elson and I talked about it. Um, you know, the O2 pitch, uh, base hit to right, it's off the plate. You know, if it's elevated a couple inches, guy fouls it off. The base hit, Jones hit over uh, Ben McLaughlin's head. Mm-hmm. The, the high chopper, just fluke. A sixteenth of an inch on the bat, that's a routine play to Ben. I mean, just so many little things like that happen. Now, where Hagen got in trouble is the lead off, the two leadoff walks. Mm-hmm. Uh, played right into K-State's hand. They were able to sack bunt. But I think if we play that regional ten more times, we win it ten times. I really do. Hagen uh, announced an All-America today uh, by the National Collegiate Baseball Writers Association. Sixth time in program history. We were talking about all the players who have been multi-time All-Americans for Arkansas, and it's a, a pretty notable list. I don't have it right here in front of me. I think I can tell you off the top of my head, though. Uh, you got Hagen, Nick Schmidt, David Walling, Jeff King, Philip Stidham, and uh, Kevin McReynolds. I mean, that's a heck of a list that's, to be uh, included with. That's Well, you asked me when I walked in, and, and I thought, uh, yeah, I think I know it. And I, was, I didn't do I think I got, do good. I got two. <laughs> you, failed, you, failed. you got an F on the test. I can't believe I left off. Uh, well, first of all, Nick Schmidt, I, I left him off. Yeah. I, um, but Jeff King, I mean, I was watching Jeff King play it at George Cole Field. Mm-hmm. And he's, you know, I wanted to be like Jeff King. So <laughs> you, you you did a good you did a good impression. <laughs> I so, appreciate that. <laughs> um, but where I was going with this is that it's it's tough for Hagen because his legacy as an Arkansas pitcher, he's he's probably the best pitcher that's ever come through here, one of the very best. But you always have to talk about those regional games with him, and so it, it's really tough, you know. So how do you balance the fact that? Hey, Hagen Smith outdueled Paul Skeens, and Hagen Smith had 17 strikeouts in six innings against a really good Oregon State team. And Hagen Smith was was pretty good on the the run to the 22 College World Series. They don't get to the World Series probably without him. The the strikeout of Rock Riggio over yeah. in Stillwater was a huge moment in that run. But you do have to talk about those two regional starts, and it's so bizarre to me that you know we talk about Arkansas being eliminated two years in a row. They had it set up like they wanted it. Yeah, winners bracket. Hagen Smith on the mound. You wouldn't want it any other way. And for whatever reason, this is the randomness of baseball. He has the the two worst outings probably of his entire career in those two regional games. 
Well, last year, last year was different. At, at playing TCU, I mean, they just they were hot. I, I think this year, I write it up as just you know fluky, just one of those things that happened in the game of baseball. I really do. Um, like I said, if we play that game ten more times, Hagen wins that game ten times. Mm. Now I. You know, I, I don't like the whole talk of like, – they talk about, like, NFL quarterbacks. Well, he hadn't won the big game yet. Yeah, well, I don't like that either. You know, I don't like that. You're either great or you're not great. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a there, there's there's a clutch player, too. Um, I mean, Tom Brady, clutch, right? I mean, there's certain guys that are clutch. I don't judge Hagen any different, and I know there was a lot of negativity out there. I think he's probably the best pitcher to ever come through here. I've never seen anyone dominate like him in the SEC. I mean, to, to do it against SEC hitters is remarkable. I think that was a giant fluke what happened. Um, the thing is, the two walks. Now, they weren't like four-pitch walks. I think one was a six-pitch walk, one was a seven-pitch walk, but you still can't walk two K-State hitters after we throw up a two-spot mm -hmm. in the top of the fifth. So, uh, to me, it, it doesn't change the way I view Hagen at all. Now, I'm in the minority there, I think. I think a lot of people look at it and they put an asterisk beside it. I don't. I think you just have to kind of step back. I mean, if you're – and and I think that we will appreciate what he's done more as more time is removed from that regional start. Uh, you're right. It, it was not like the year before in, in a lot of ways. TCU jumped on him from the start. There, of course, was the rain delay that caused him, you know, not to start on Saturday right. and, and he's starting on Sunday all of a sudden. This one, he pitched really well, I thought, for four innings. And I just had the feeling that when they went up two to nothing in the, the top of the fifth, it's like that's, that's the ball game because you got Hagan on the mound – Pretty rested bullpen. Uh, you know, if you get even a, a somewhat normal start from Hagen uh, and you you uh, pair that with what Ben Bybee did out of the bullpen in that game, they're in the winner's bracket, and we're probably having a different discussion today. Yeah, I think so. Um, you know, I know, I know between innings, Phil said off the air, come on, Hagen, throw up a zero right here. Because if we throw up a zero right there, I mean, we're, we're golden. It just it just didn't happen. Now I go back and look at the day before. I mean, we're up eight nothing on Semo. Who would have ever thought we would have had to use Will McIntyre, Christian Fouch, Gabe Gackle, and Jake Faraday in that game? Yeah. You know, when we're yeah. up eight nothing. You know, next thing you know, it's eight eight. I mean, I Wasn't thought that, that surprising. Was, oh my god! I thought you know eight <laughs> nothing with this bullpen. It's I mean, you're you're on cruise control. Yeah. <laughs> And it wasn't like it was, you know, the slow build to 8-8. Eight, eight. It was like, bam. I know. It, it, was, it was amazing. Well, and I think that was kind of, I don't know. It, but I still felt good when we came back and we scored. We ended up winning 17-9, to kind of going away. I felt really good. I thought, okay, whew, we got that one out of our system. Now let's go. <laughs> let's go get them. Um, but, you know, that's baseball, Matt, and, and I love it. And the beauty of it is, think of another sport where SEMO can come in and do what they did. I mean, think about it. In football, you, no. you, it would never – they can't come in I remember in the last beat. time Samo came to Arkansas for a football game. It yeah. wasn't pretty. <laughs> but isn't that the beauty of baseball? As much as I yeah. love baseball, it'll rip your freaking heart out. <laughs> and that's the thing, man. It's uh, um, Anything can happen. You know, you get a guy on the mound that's, that's hot. Wilma had a good start against us. He's got horrible numbers. I mean, he'd been getting lit up in the, the OVC. Um. He just had a good day against us. Hit his spots with his fastball, upper 80s, breaking ball, 60s, 60s. He threw 66. a 62-mile-an-hour breaking yeah, ball in that game. That. It looked like a – it was like the – I always talk about the Bugs Bunny changeup. It was the Bugs Bunny curveball. It just went up there, and I can't remember who he threw it to. It might have been Aloy uh, way out front on it. And the thing about that pitch, though, you can see it out of his hand. It's got a hump. So if you're a hitter, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Out of his hand, it has a hump, so you know immediately – Immediately, that's that's a breaking ball. But you know, you're looking at almost 30 miles an hour from the curveball to the fastball, and that's a that's a tough adjustment. Then he mixed in that little 76 mile an hour slider, slurve, whatever you want to call it. Oh, sweeper. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you know, it's like uh, a lot of times Grambling or UAPB or, or teams like that will come in on a Tuesday night and they'll throw these guys that are throwing. Pitches like that, and we'll see the Arkansas hitters. It might take them an inning or two innings, maybe three innings in some cases, to to get on top of that pitch. That's on a Tuesday night in February. It, it's a whole different level of uh, pressure when you're trying to do that in a, a an elimination type setting. Okay, so answer me this. Uh, I listened to an interview with uh, I think it was Mike Rooney, and he was talking okay, about yep. 
talking about uh, Fayetteville Regionals, and he was looking back at our past history. Um, he said we play tight at home. I, I don't know. I don't know if he came right out and said it. He alluded to the fact he compared us to Ole in Miss regionals? in regionals and super regionals playing tight at home. He compared us to uh, Ole Miss, which really for me that sucks. That kind of boils my blood. <laughs> but uh, yeah, he said that. He said it. You know, is there a tightness when well, it comes to Fayetteville regionals? And that might be fair. The last two years, I think if you go back before that, I mean, look at what the eighteen and nineteen teams True. did. Um, those 18 and 19 teams didn't play tight in game three of their super regionals. They, they beat yeah. the snot out of South Carolina and Ole Miss. So I don't know. Maybe they're, I think that, you know, for better or worse, what people remember about postseason in, in, in Fayetteville right now, people have short term memories. They remember North Carolina State mm. and they remember TCU and they remember K State and SEMO. Yeah. I yeah. mean, it's so, I don't know. Maybe, maybe long term, I don't know that it's fair. Short term, there, there may be something there because. They've been great at home the last two years. They were thirty-four and three at home before the last two games of the season this year. I mean, they hadn't lost back-to-back home games since uh, I think twenty-two was the last time it happened against Vanderbilt. So, yeah, um, yeah I don't know. It's it's a uh, it's it's there. I go back to the randomness of baseball is so hard to explain. It it really is. It really How is. How else do you explain Florida winning five in a row and getting to the College World Series? They had had a five-game win streak, Bubba, since February. <laughs> That's when they're playing, you know, directional you. Okay, now, I did say, I said Florida's, oh, I would you not want them to be, yeah, I wouldn't want to be in their regional. Yep. Um, I, I've i liked Florida all year. I look at Florida a lot like I look at uh, Ole Miss in 22. Mm-hmm. When, when we played them in 22, I'm looking at them, I'm like, how is this team not winning? And I looked at Florida the same way, and and I'm kind of on the Florida bandwagon right now, to be honest with you. And we'll talk more <laughs> about the College World Series teams here in a minute, but for Florida, they, they just had freshman pitching that just took a long time to yeah. grow up, and they're finally you know pitching. And I think that's kind of scary for the SEC next year because yeah. now all of a sudden you're seeing yep. what these guys can do, and they're, you know, I mean, if, unless Transfer Portal comes calling – they're going to be in the fold for Florida for the next year or two. So, But we'll get to that here in just a minute. I want to note that uh, Gabe Gackle and Colin Fisher were named to the Freshman All-America team this week. They are the 27th and 28th Razorback uh, Freshman All-Americans, the first since Hagan and Brady Tiger did it in 2022. I was not surprised to see Gackle on it. I put him on my ballot. Uh, for Fisher, that was a little bit of a surprise. And I think it also underscored a little bit of, um, you know, we overlooked. I mean, not overlooked is the right word, but. Uh, there, there was a tendency to overlook at the end of the year who they were missing in the bullpen. I mean, Colin Fisher, when Mason Molina and Brady Tiger aren't pitching well down the stretch, if he's healthy, he yeah. moves into the starting rotation because of what he was doing on Tuesday and Wednesdays. Um, you know, they they had Hunter Dietz was out at the end of the year. Cooper Dossett was not available. Obviously, Tiger was out. Um, so, but but for Fisher, I think that the freshman All America thing uh, for him the other day kind of underscored just how much they were missing when they didn't have him. Yeah, I think so. I think. You know, and you look at Hunter Dietz also. Mm-hmm. Uh, Cooper Dossett was the one that came in. Cooper got some big outs for us later in the year until he hurt his arm um, throwing that cutter. Um, there were some pieces missing, but I think on the starting pitching role, you know, Phil had some unbelievable numbers uh, last week. We were talking about it and talking about starting pitching, just where we were and then how, you know, you're looking at three quarters of the way through the season. You're all of a sudden, the, the identity of your team changes. Mm-hmm. You know, you go from a team that's just relying on starting pitching and defense, scoring enough runs to win, to all of a sudden you really have one starter you can rely on. I mm-hmm. don't think Brady was healthy, and I don't think Molina was right. Um, and and so all of a sudden you're kind of changing the way you're, <laughs> you're look, you view a weekend, and that's, yeah. that's hard to do mid, you know, mid-stride to all of a sudden, okay, now we, you know, this amount of runs isn't going to win. Now we've got to start scoring more runs. And, you know, it kind of it's tough to change that identity of your team right in the middle of the season. Yeah, and, and I wrote that after the regional. I said they just lacked an identity in, in the regional. They didn't have pitching, and they had, they had hits, but they yeah. didn't have the timely hits. And that was really the thing that hurt them in, in the regionals. That, I mean, they had a ton of opportunities to plate runs against K-State. They all hit K-State like 13-5. to 5. Yep, um, <laughs> and K State made two errors. Yeah, oh, that's I mean, one, that's something I was going to bring up. That stat line is just it's you. Yeah. You look at that stat line. Take away the run scored, thirteen five and two zero in errors, and you would think it's a run away for one team, and yeah. it just wasn't the case. Yeah, you look especially with Hagen on the mound. You look at that and you're like, oh, we killed them that game. Yeah, <laughs> we blew them out. 
<laughs> you know, and, and hitting with runners in scoring position was not a problem against uh, SEMO in game one. Right. They scored 17 runs. They popped, what, three home three three run home runs. They had six home runs in the game. Um, but it, it was an issue against K-State and SEMO in, in games two and three. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's hard to think back. I had a rough weekend watching <laughs> Super Regionals. It's just hard, you know, because – you know, you, you kind of build towards that all year, and you're like, okay, you know, we've got a super regional this weekend. You kind of mark stuff out on your schedule so you don't have a lot going on that mm-hmm. weekend, and then, boom, you're not playing, and it's it's tough. I it's know abrupt. It's, yeah, and I know it's I – mean, I'm sitting here with a pity party. It's way harder for DVH and the staff and, and all the players because I know how much work they put in, but, you know, it's uh, it's it's tough. But, yeah, I mean, but still, SEC West, five out of six years – 20 games in the SEC, that's impressive. I, I don't care. We didn't we didn't finish it, but that's still a lot to hang your hat on. Yeah, it is. Good, good programs go through lulls. I mean, think about Kansas basketball. They won a national championship yeah. two years ago. The other five years in that six-year run, they haven't been past the first weekend. So it, it just happens sometimes. Yeah. You go through these lulls uh, when, when you're a good program, Arkansas. They've been to the World Series a bunch of times. There's no real reason to think that they're not going to get back there. You know, sometimes it just comes – I think it comes down to matchups. Um, it comes down to maybe different things going on with your personnel. Uh, the pitching looked tired for Arkansas at the end of the year. Yeah. And and do you think it was the injuries? Do you think it was something else? Um, I think, honestly, I think it's so many high-stress innings. Because mm. you think about it. So like, many close games. Yeah, there's so many close games. So, like, every pitch, there's so much emphasis on every pitch. You know, DVH talks about it all the time. Well – you know, he was kind of cruising. We let him go a little bit. Not a lot of high leverage pitches. You know, just kind of out there throwing. There's a difference in in pitching in a seven nothing ball game and a zero mm-hmm. zero ball game. I mean, the intensity is there every pitch. Where, you know, I think Hagen all year Friday night. I mean, he was the man pitching, and he wasn't getting a lot of run support. That's two to one, one to nothing yeah, oh, every game. Yeah. So every pitch, there was so much emphasis. I mean, one mistake and mm-hmm. I tell you what Matt I think that wears on you and I think the same with the bullpen you look at some of these guys coming out of the pen they came out in a lot of high leverage situations mm-hmm. there's not a lot of easy pitches being thrown and I think that just really wears on you in the course of the season now I'm not making an excuse for them I'm just saying it's factual you know when you get to June and I thought they did a great job of managing Hagen's pitches but he's a max effort guy Every pitch he throws, he's not like an Isaiah Campbell smooth delivery. I mean, he's max effort. So, I think when you get into June, I think it starts to wear on you. So you need you need a better lineup during the regular season to to help your pitching in the postseason. Yeah, I think. Well, you need a more productive lineup. I think. I think we had the pieces there. I just don't think we ever fully clicked. I really don't. I, I tell you what, we clicked against Simo. <laughs> <laughs> they did. They did that. You know, they they had some games toward the end of the year where it was it was going well, but then yeah, you know, you you it was never consistent. You'd score nine runs against Mississippi yeah. State, and then you'd come back and it yeah. was off again the next game, and th- that that was the tough part. Some of that's due to pitching. Yeah. Um, let me ask you this: you know, like we saw Ty Wilmsmeyer at the end of the year, he was their best hitter in the regional, maybe. Yeah. Um, but he wasn't always in the lineup. The lineup was constantly in flux throughout the season, trying to find the right pieces to give him consistency. It, th- does that affect the overall play of the offense throughout the year? If, if you don't have you, a consistent lineup. I'll tell you, as a player, there's no better feeling than knowing you're going to be in the lineup that next day. Mm-hmm. There's just something about it. And, you know, if you, you know, now competition breeds success. You know, so there's so much competition for each starting position. You can look at it two ways. As a player, I liked going to the yard knowing I was in the lineup. Mm-hmm. There was just nothing. There's no better feeling than you go to bed at night. Boy, you sleep good knowing you're where you're going to be the next day, where you're hitting in the lineup, where you're playing. That's a comforting feeling as a baseball player. When you don't know that, it's tough. And I'm not. I'm not knocking DVH. I mean, he all year he was trying to find the right mix of players. And he was say he kept saying, "I want someone to take that position. Someone mm-hmm. take center field. Someone take left field." Mm-hmm. You know, um, and it just never really it, it didn't materialize really. But you know, I was proud of Ty the way he finished up. He found a way to get on base, and boy, once he gets on base, I mean, he's a weapon. I mean, there's so many things he can do. I think there were three errors in that first Simo game, yeah. and all three of them were whenever he was yeah that bad. He got yeah, on all right. three times. And I think maybe his speed probably causes a, a fielder to maybe rush his his process. 
Oh, they look up. They they feel that ball and they look up. You can see their eyes come off the ball and look at Ty running down the line and mm-hmm. like, oh, I gotta get rid of this yeah. thing. Yeah, we got many. We got a lot more to come here on the Whole Hog Baseball Podcast. We'll look forward to 2025. Like I said, we'll talk about the College World Series and what we've seen from the postseason so far. But first, a word from our sponsor. At Kendall King, we're proud of over four decades of design. We're continuing the legacy of great creative design by combining our brands of Kendall King, Soapbox, and Shopcart. Together, these brands represent a new focus in marketing design with individual attention to specific areas. Through our design expertise supported by a team of talented professionals, we showcase our best. We are Kindle King. We are Soapbox. We are Shopcart. We are Design. And welcome back in. Uh, The College World Series uh, begins on Friday up in Omaha. It's going to be four SEC teams and four ACC teams. And if you looked at the polls throughout the season, uh, this probably shouldn't surprise you a whole lot. Florida is a surprise being in the World Series. I would say the other seven teams are not surprises. They were teams who have uh, been pretty good throughout the, the the regular season. But, you know, it seemed like every time that I would write those poll stories throughout the regular season, Bubba, it'd be, you know, top 11 teams. There'd be five from the SEC. There'd be five from the ACC. There might be – eight total SEC teams in the top 25, seven from the ACC. These two leagues this year, and really for the last, I would say, 10 years, have just totally dominated college baseball. And it it makes you wonder, are we going to see more of this in the World Series? You know, because what's happening is that the SEC teams and the ACC teams, to a lesser extent, are pouring so many resources into baseball that – whether it be NIL, whether it be top head coaches, top assistant coaches, facilities, whatever, you know, you name it, um, they're becoming the attractive place to play for players. Yeah. And so I wonder how some of these other conferences are going to be able to keep up with these two conferences because, you know, maybe we're overgeneralizing things here with all eight being from those two conferences. But really it's kind of a, a microcosm of what we've seen for a decade. Well, you look at the shift from like like back when – Back in the day when I played, you know, it was West Coast. You had all those West Coast teams would dominate. You had Arizona yep. State, you had Arizona. You had, um, oh, my gosh. Fullerton. Yeah, Irvine. Cal State Fullerton. Yep. I mean, all those teams were good every year, and it's shifted now. And, you know, and and you hear the people out on the West Coast complain because SEC gets all the, the notoriety. Mm-hmm. Well, it's justified. Look every year. They get the players, too. You know, something that yeah. stood out to me, yeah. I was in College Station, and it was like Gabe Gackles pitching from Aptus, California. Yeah. And Gavin Grohovac has come in from California. Yeah. And, I mean, there were so many Californians. It's like I really think the TV component here is is a big deal. And I wonder uh, – well, the, the, the TV component, I'll, I'll say on this topic for a second, they see what's going on in the SEC. Mm-hmm. And they might turn on a Southern Cal game and there's 150 people in the ballpark. Right. They want to go be part of that. Yeah. And then they also see the, the the number of prospects that are coming out of SEC and ACC schools and going into the, the major league draft. I mean, it, it seems like every year Arkansas has got 10 or 11 players. Tennessee's got 10 or 11 players. Florida, LSU, the same. They want to go there where they see people being developed. Well, you, you talked about the atmosphere at A&M. Um, did you watch the Oregon A&M game? I did. Oregon's up eight four. Oh man, and the, the crowd, crowd just the crowd got into it, and, and I'm sitting there with my wife and and uh, son watching it, and she's like, "How many people are in that stadium?" And I said, "I don't know, probably around ten thousand. They announced it like seventy eight hundred. Yeah, I believe that. Um, but it looked it looked like fifty thousand, sounded like fifty thousand fans, but that that poor Oregon pitcher, it's just, the loneliest place in the oh. world. Is that is that is that mound? In that ballpark, <laughs> absolutely. I mean, it's it was like that back in the day at yeah. the old ballpark. But I tell you what, it's it was crazy. Um, and you watch those pitchers just melt down. They could not find the strike zone. And I, 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 I honestly, I, I felt bad for the guy because they left him out there. I mean, it was eight to four. I want to say he walked four and hit one. Mm-hmm. Um, then they bring in some of dude. He walks the first guy and then gives up a grand slam, They're, which was kind of cool. They gave up a grand slam to the guy that took uh, Braden Montgomery. I hate that that dude got hurt, Braden Montgomery. Yeah, I hate that he got hurt. But um, the guy that replaced him hits grand slam. Caden Kent, you know, it's Jeff Kent's son, right? I did not yeah, know it's that. Jeff Kent's son. Um, but I called that grand slam. We've got a group text with with 
bunch of people that, that we work with and, you know, we're watching all these regional games and it's like, hey, you need to turn it over here. And so it's like this feels like a spot where they're going to give up a grand slam because they're throwing so many pitches out of the zone. They're going to yeah. hang one over the middle of the plate. Yeah. And sure enough, boom. And, and that totally changed. It kind of felt like a Charlie Welch moment. Yeah. Didn't it? I mean, it was yeah. a different kind of game, but it was a similar type of situation in that, you know, it's it's a tight game and then all of a sudden you got walks and you you know you're you gotta you gotta put one over the plate and when you do the hitter's ready for it. Well, I say all the time, I can look at a guy and tell if he's a hitter or not. And when they showed a close up of the Oregon pitcher, that poor dude looked there was fear on his face. I mean he <laughs> he just did not want to throw the ball. It just did not look like a – like I can look at a Gabe Gackle. And I think there was one time all year I saw Gabe look uncomfortable on the mound. Mm. Um, this guy did not want the ball. Like you look at Hagen, Hagen's dominant. I mean, he looks like he's going to dominate you. You know, Caglione steps up to the plate. Caglione looks like he owns you yeah. before he even swings a bat. I mean, there's guys that have that look. Those poor Oregon pitchers did not want to throw that ball, Matt, and uh, that place was crazy. And it was it was fun to watch, but it was painful at the same time. You know, they're about to renovate that stadium. They're about to make it bigger in College Station. Wow. I mean, the, in fact, when they came, I believe I've got this right. When they came to Fayetteville in twenty two, uh, Schlossnagel, it was twenty two, maybe it was twenty three, but anyway, uh, it was twenty three. Schlossnagel brought uh, one of his ads with him. You know, when they, they looked around the ballpark, he had actually done this when he was at TCU, too, when they were here for the regionals in 19. Yeah. Uh, Del Conte, who's now the AD at Texas, I believe that he accompanied with them here, and they were getting ready to do some some ballpark renovations in, in Fort Worth. And so then he gets the job at A&M. They bring somebody here, and, and they look at Baum, and, and they're, they're getting ready to add some more seats there. I think it's going to look a lot like Baum where you're probably going to have seats all the way down each foul line yeah. and maybe some more seats out in the outfield. It'll it'll it's it's already one of the tough places to play in the SEC, but I think it's about to be um considered right there with Fayetteville, Starkville, Baton Rouge, Oxford, those types of ballparks. I think their fans do a great job of just getting on the other opponents. Now, I didn't like when they got on Dawson, Cooper Dawson after when he got hurt. yeah, when he got hurt and then then they started the the ball five chant. I didn't, I didn't like that. I thought that was classless. That's Razorback fans wouldn't have done that. Um, I don't know, but other, I mean, it's a tough play. It's a it's a tough environment a very, to go it's, play. It's the best environment I've ever experienced for college baseball. Really, it's uh, it's pretty impressive. But you, it, you would think it it seems bigger than seventy eight hundred. It does. It really does. It's it, about it, to be a lot bigger. Yeah. So <laughs> I but, still like Bomb Walker better. The, the double deck nature of it kind of yeah. kind of adds to that a little bit too yeah. because it does feel like everybody is right there on top of you. So A and M's there. Uh, did you see Florida Clemson their game uh, two in their super regional? Yeah, game uh, of the year in my opinion. I was actually mowing and I was listening to the Florida broadcasters okay. and and they did a, they did a really good job. Um, I like me and Phil, but and and I listen to other guys and I I, I don't like most broadcasts. I, I listened did, to North Carolina the other night and I had this thought. It's like how on earth is a pro, <laughs> is this a program at North Carolina not have a better broadcast than this? I listened to a few really bad ones, but I actually got the guy's number from Phil and texted him after the game mm. and just said, congratulations. I, I, I just told him, you know, I really enjoyed th – they did a really good job. But So I'm listening to it, and finally I couldn't take it anymore. I went inside and watched the last few innings. Did you see the catch? Yes. That's Were you incredible. watching that live? No, I went inside to watch okay. the – that's when I went inside, after the catch. Yeah. Actually, no, I went inside and then I left and I came back inside after the catch. So if you didn't see it, Clemson, the, the same player for Clemson, their center fielder, he hits a – two or a three-run home run in the top of the ninth that ties the game, sends it into extra innings, and then in the tenth he makes a Willie Mays-style catch yeah. up against the wall that was probably the best college catch I can remember. Yeah, uh, The moment, everything, if, if he doesn't make the catch, Florida's got a runner in scoring position and, and Florida wins the game. Now, Florida ultimately ended up winning that game in the 13th, but uh, the I hated the ump show in the game. I did not think the umpires uh, handled – the two situations very well. Number one was the collision with the Clemson base runner and Caglione yeah. uh, in the second inning of that game. And then in the 13th inning, throwing out Jack Leggett, of all people. I mean, my <laughs> gosh, that guy hasn't – I know he's he's back as a volunteer coach at, at Clemson, but he probably hasn't been ejected from a game in 10-plus years. 
and he gets thrown out. And I think what he was upset about was that the Clemson guy hits a home run that puts them up in the top 13th. He slams his bat down toward his dugout, which is permissible, but he gets a warning. And I think what Leggett was upset about was that Caglione had done the exact same thing in the first inning, yeah. and there's no warning issued. And so I, th- I think that's where all of that kind of came from. And then you know, the replay has got to get figured out by the NCAA on these quote-unquote benches clearing situations because we saw it in Georgia, yeah. Mississippi State earlier this year. It was like a 37-minute delay. It was an 18-minute delay in the Clemson-Florida game the other day. And quite frankly, the guys who get thrown out in those situations should not be thrown out. Mm-hmm. The Clemson base runner, okay, so should he go over there into the fracas? You know, probably not. But you're a baseball player. You're going to get in there and stand up for your guy. Right. There's nothing that he did, though, in that situation that warranted an injection. Yeah. Nothing. And to me, spending 18 minutes on a review when no punches are thrown, a couple of guys just push each other in the chest – I mean, what are we doing here? And it affects the flow of the game. I agree. I think just play ball. You know, just let them, let them play. You know, break it up. Say, okay, go back to your dugouts. Let's go. That's baseball. That's yeah. that's a heated. It's a heated game. Let them play the game. I'll tell you what. The, the thing that stood out for me was the left-handed pitcher they brought in. Clemson brought in. He he struck a guy out. I want to say it was in the twelfth inning. Oh, he he yapped at the. And he points at him, and he ran his mouth. And I looked at my son. I said, Dalton, look at that. I said, the baseball gods, just watch what (laughs) happens. And the next inning, he got walked off on. I thought it was awesome. You don't do that. Why do you point at him? Who did he strike out? I want to say it was Shelton he struck out. And he was running his mouth. I mean, be excited. Go back to your dugout. We saw Eric Backage. He was, like, trying to push him off the field. Yeah. Because Backage was uh, coaching one of the bases. Yeah. And he's trying to get him. I think he knew. It was like, you, you can't do that. Yeah, you don't poke the bear. Yeah. Because I promise you, every hitter in that Florida dugout saw that. And and you, it's a it's a mental game, Matt. Yeah. You just need just that much more of a mental edge is all it takes. You just bear down just that little bit is the difference sometimes. And I'm telling you, that it it came back to haunt him. It came back to bite him. And I, and I told my son that don't do that. Do not act like that on a baseball field. Go celebrate towards your dugout. Be mm-hmm. fired up. Yell. Do whatever you want. But don't point at the guy you just struck out because it comes back to bite you every time. The SEC goes 4-1 and one in Super Regionals. A&M advances. Uh, Florida, we just mentioned, they advanced. Tennessee, they had a little bit of a scare having to go to Game 3 against Evansville, uh, but they get through that. And, um, boy, I'm drawing a blank. Kentucky, they beat Oregon State to go to Omaha for the first time. Uh, that was kind of a cool scene to watch that celebration there late in that game. I, th- I thought Oregon State would go there and beat Kentucky, and I was kind of surprised the the way those two games went, one close game and one blowout. And then Georgia loses game three to North Carolina State. NC State's back out of the ACC. you got NC State, you got UNC, you've got Virginia, and you've got Florida State. So pretty, you know, in, in terms of name appeal, this is one of the best name appeal College World Series that, that we've had in quite some time. And one of the things I like about it, is that six of the teams have never won a national championship. Yeah. And the other two teams who have won championships, number one, it's been a while. Uh, Virginia's been nine years. Florida, it's been seven. Uh, but those are their only titles. And so you've, you've got a deal where you could have a first-time national champion or you've got a deal where one of these programs can elevate itself to become one of very few with multiple national championships. So who are you pulling for? I don't know if I'm pulling for anybody. I like watching North Carolina, though. They have been a lot of fun to watch this year. Uh, they've got three walk-off wins in the regional or in the in the postseason. Uh, I think Vance Honeycutt, who we saw in person over there a couple of years ago during the Super, I think he's an incredible player yeah. who does not get talked about enough. You right. know, he doesn't get talked about with the Charlie Condons and the Jack Caglions, um, and and maybe even some lesser position players who are not as talented as he is. But defensively, he is phenomenal. Yeah. And then you talk about the the clutch gene. I mean, how about that home run that he had? Yeah. Uh, to walk off West Virginia in game one of the Super. I mean, the guy's the real deal. I remember when we went there and he was a freshman, there was one situation where first base was open, and I'm like, let's do not pitch to this guy. And we pitched to him, and he burned us. Yeah. And, I mean, the guy's mm-hmm. just, like you said, clutch. Some guys just have that ability to slow the game down and just be clutch in that moment. Um, I'm not saying I'm pulling for NC State. I, I think NC State – a couple years ago during the COVID oh, thing, they got, they got so – oh, they got done wrong yeah. against Vandy. Yeah. And that made me so mad because it was Vandy. And I almost felt like that was one of those NCAA decisions. 
I mean, I don't know how else you could handle that because all their players were sick. But well, they weren't sick. It was all their contact tracing. Well, which, that, thank God we're past all that. Yeah. Oh my God. But I just think if it had it been anyone but Vandy, it, it probably wouldn't have bothered me as much. But the mm. fact that Vandy was awarded the win and they weren't allowed to play, I I hated that. So I almost I almost feel for NC State. I'm I'm, I'm a little bit of me is kind of pulling for them. And then honestly, I'd I'd like to see. Uh, I'd like to see Florida. I, I mean, mm. and then, uh, you know, well, watching about those, are the, those are the two teams with, I think, the worst records in the World Series. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, look at look at what was Florida, 13 and 17 in SEC. Yeah. Remember how many haters there were saying, well, why are they getting in? You know, and there were some teams with better resumes that didn't get in, and Florida got picked over them. But look. I think it's justified, though. Just – just because they've gone on a run in the postseason does not mean that they were worthy of getting one of the postseason bids. I in, in my opinion, same I, thing with Ole Miss two years ago. But how do you look at some of the teams that Florida beat this year? Though they yeah. beat some really good teams. Um, oh, they did. I mean, they 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 had two wins over or two series wins over national seeds, and then I think they had one win apiece over three or four other national seeds. So the the resume was fine. It's just the fact that if they would have lost one more regular season game, they couldn't have even qualified because they were 28 yeah. and 27. Yeah. If you have yeah. a losing record and you don't win your conference tournament, then you can't get into the postseason. So it, it's it's an interesting deal. It's I know they're talented. I still don't think they deserve to be in the postseason, but kudos to them for making the most right. of their opportunity. Kind of like Ole Miss. Yeah. Everyone complained when Ole Miss got in, 22. Okay, one more question. I know we're getting down a, a wormhole here. Um <laughs> Like the OVC, I look at UALR, and you and I talked about it last podcast. Mm -hmm. I think they got screwed. They won the the league. I think if you win your league, you should be in. Absolutely. I don't think it's the team that wins the tournament. I, I agree. I mean, I mean, look at the SEC tournament. We don't we don't care if we win that. Um, now, I guess I mean there's some teams that go down there having to win to mm -hmm. to get in. Um, I don't know. I just – I don't know. And But then you look at SEMO. You know, we would have been playing UALR instead of SEMO. Mm -hmm. um, I just don't like that. I feel like – I think Euler got done wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think they should have been in. But that's – I don't know. I, I think the criteria I, – I think it needs to be more clear. I don't know. That's not really proper English. But I think, I think there needs to – uh, we need to know what what are you supposed to do to get in? Is it strength of schedule? Is it winning your tournament? Is it playing good at the end of the year? You know, uh, is it who you beat? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think strength of schedule is a huge deal. It is. I, huge, I think I think yes. Florida this year proves that it was yeah. a, a, a huge deal. So uh, uh, Paul Maneri's back in the SEC. Have you seen this? Saw South that. Carolina. Yeah. What do you think of that? Eh, I don't know. I mean, yeah. I mean, it's, I, it's I an think odd hire to it, me because it felt like he got run out of LSU. I thought they would go after someone. Like I thought Cliff they would. Cliff Godwin was who I had thought. Who? Like a Cliff Godwin. Yeah. You know, someone who's yeah. in the area, who's established, yeah. but knows the SEC. But um, it, it's Ray Tanner's hires are interesting to me because yeah. he has done it right in basketball with Lamont Paris. Uh, I think he's done it right to an extent in football with Shane Beamer. Um, I don't think they're going to be you know, like elite of the elite in the SEC. But uh, I think Beamer's the type that's going to, you know, they're, they're going to win seven, eight games most years, uh, maybe more. Uh, baseball, he can't get it right. I yeah. mean, Chad Holbrook yeah. it wasn't right. Uh, Kingston got him to a couple of super regionals but can never get him over that hump. And I don't know, Maneri, the thing about Maneri that's interesting to me is that the last year that he coached was 2021. The game has changed a ton since then in terms of <laughs> roster building. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it. I'm, I'm interested to see – you know, is is he kind of a figurehead, and he lets all the assistant coaches do the work? Um, yeah, th it's interesting to me how how this is going to work out for them. I thought they'd go after a guy like a Josh Elander, someone like that. I thought they'd find like an assistant that's, you know, and I don't even know if Elander. I don't even know if he applied. I don't even know if he was in the mix. Um, I don't even know who they looked at, but I kind of thought they were they would go a different direction. That's like what that. a lot of their fans wanted was Elander. Really? Yeah, I mean it was that was a, a very popular name from what I was seeing. Yeah, uh, was that they they would like to see him get that job, but then again, you know who who knows how long Tennessee keeps going. It's a hard thing for these coaches who are on teams that get deep into Omaha to get head coaching positions because you got to start building your roster yeah. in you know, like start of June. <laughs> True. And so if you're coaching until June 24th, 25th yeah. up in, in at the World Series, you know, it, it's it's good for you. It's not good for you at the same time in, in terms of maybe having an opportunity to be a head coach somewhere. 
last thing on uh, on the portal. Did you see the Gary Gilmore? Uh, uh, yes, his interview. Yeah, it's awesome. Yeah, I loved it. I I absolutely loved it, and that's why I feel for DVH and the coaching staff and and all coaches. Actually, I don't care about some of the other coaches. <laughs> I feel for uh, some of the coaches in today's game how it's changed. I mean, if you just take what he said about free agency in any other sport, if you could just you know, because you commit to a kid, and you know it just it means nothing. They can they can be gone the next day, and it kind of goes back to. It's kind of it's trickled down. Like I I run an academy, and mm-hmm. you know a lot of the parents are like, well, if it doesn't work out, it's the coach's fault. And now it's it's in college baseball. Um, if I don't play, it's the coach's fault. There's no. Like, why don't we stay here and develop? Mm-hmm. You know, let's develop. You look at a guy like uh, Souza. Souza got some at bats this year for us. He's going to be an absolute stud. Now, you know, if he if his attitude was oh, the, you know, I didn't start every day, I'm leaving. You know, it takes that whole freshman development out of it. I mean, you know, I battled as a freshman to get in the lineup and get a few at-bats, you know. Um, I didn't transfer, you know. I, I wanted to be a Razorback. Um, I don't know. I, I hope we're not losing that. It uh, To me, Matt, I go back to, and I know I'm old school, it's it's turning into it's not about the name on the front of the jersey it's about the name on the back and and I think DVH is still doing a great job of getting guys to play for the name on the front mm-hmm. when we lose that we lose Razorback baseball we lose what Razorback baseball is all about in my opinion I hope we continue to bring in the right guys I love what Tony Vitella said I don't like a lot of what he says I like what he said if you're coming to Tennessee with your hand out wanting money don't don't waste our time don't waste your time hmm. I loved what he said right there. There's never been a coach that wore his emotions on his sleeve like Tony. Oh, my gosh. I mean, <laughs> that, that's that's how he was when he was here, too. Um, you know, one of the criticisms that I've heard in, in the, the week and a half since uh, the, the season ended, and I think it was from somebody at D1 Baseball. You were talking about Mike Rooney earlier. It might have been in the same podcast. Is that there's not a lot of homegrown position talent mm-hmm. at Arkansas. You know, I mean, it's yeah. the last few years it's been going out and basically rebuilding your lineup through the portal, I think some of it is fair. I think some of it may be a little bit unfair. They they had four position players who got drafted last year and and all signed. If they get one of those players or, or a couple of them to campus, it, it maybe changes that um, that discussion a little bit. But you know, this year you had Stovall and Diggs. That was it in terms right. of, of homegrown players. Uh, you think about next year, you know, probably have Ryder Helfrich uh, will be a, a starter. Um, but that's that may be it in terms of homegrown, unless there's a freshman that comes in and really just blows you away. What are what are your thoughts? No, I I agree. I think it's it's getting those guys in here that that learn Razorback baseball. They learn to play for this on the front of mm-hmm. the jersey, and and it's just the game's changed so much. It's it's tough now. Hopefully, some of these guys. I know that we've got a few studs freshmen coming in i don't think we're going to get them through the draft though i think yeah. they're going to sign i think they're going to throw some money at them. Tyson lewis probably the best yeah that i've, I've seen video on him the yeah. real deal um there's there's some dudes that if we can get them here and keep them for three years mm-hmm. i mean we're golden yeah. you know i just don't know if it's going to happen i don't know you know we're not as we're not like um some of these schools, you know, I think A and M is one of those that's going to throw a bunch of money at kids mm. to keep them from going in the draft. Mm-hmm. I don't, I don't think DVH is going to do that. I think, you know, I mean, there is some NIL stuff, but I, I don't know. I, I think it's, I, I think it's just getting the right player here, playing for the right reasons, and I'm, I think we're losing some of that. The NCAA uh, settlement in the House case is also kind of interesting in terms of of how that's going to affect players coming into uh, college because. Now you're going to potentially have full scholarships, no, no more of this 11.7 thing, and I think that you know, that that could be enticing to some. I don't sure. know if it'll be, but you know, it's 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 certainly something to think about. Um, seems like it's easier to get pitchers through the draft right now than it is to get in the elite ones. Maybe to get elite pitchers through the draft than it is elite hitters. I mean, you think back over the last few years at Arkansas, they've gotten Gackle through, they've gotten Hunter Dietz through, uh, they've gotten Hagen through, uh, but but. Stovall is probably the only hitter that you can say would be of that caliber that they've been able to get through the draft. We mentioned the fourth that they lost last year. There've yeah. there've been uh, uh, plenty of others. But you why know, why do you think? Sorry to cut you off. In in your opinion, why is that? And I have no idea. 
I, I really don't I really don't know. Maybe it's you think it's the reputation of, of hops? It's the yeah, it's the development here. Okay. I mean, look at what we if you're in the minor leagues, I mean, so if I'm a scout, I want to know. You you watch the Oregon guys melt down mm-hmm. on the mound, all right, in front of seventy eight hundred people. Well, you got to be able to perform in front of a big crowd. So if I'm a pitcher, look at Hagen Smith. Look how much better he got every year. Look at Christian mm-hmm. Fouch. Look at Faherty. Look at Cooper Dawson. Look at our whole freshman class from last year coming into this year, how much they got better. Mm-hmm. If they're in the minor leagues, if they sign mm-hmm. and go to the minor leagues, they're not getting developed like that, Matt. Mm-hmm. There's not. There's not the pitching lab. There's not the hunt center in a minor league <laughs> in this minor league ballpark. I mean, there's some technology now, but there's nothing like what we have here. If I'm a pitcher, I mean, look how much Velo Hagen gained from his freshman year to this past year. Look at his draft stock, where he went. Um, And you see it all the time in guys. I just think the ability to come here and develop, learn to pitch here, gets you ready to pitch in the big leagues. Like Hagen could leave today – and go to a major league team and get people out right now in the big leagues. There's no, there's not very many guys in college baseball. I think you could do that. Hagen's one of them right now. You could put in a rotation. He's going to get outs, or you put him in the bullpen. He's going to get outs for you. Any thought on uh, Wahio Aloy transferring to Arkansas? It's a Bahiba's brother. He played at BYU. Um, I don't I don't know. I saw him at the ballpark. I, I saw him too. Yeah, I was pretty big, sure I saw him. Yeah, big dude. Yeah. Um, at least I think that's him. I was. I, looking I'm, at. I'm yeah. pretty certain it's him. Um. I don't know much about him. Look at his numbers. Yeah, they're all right. No, but, they, don't, know, they don't jump out to you yeah. like Vahivas did. But, but on the other hand, he played better competition than Vahiva did at yeah. Sac State. So, you know, we'll see. I mean, I think it's I think it's good. I, the thing I like about it, that means Vahiva's going to stay. <laughs> we don't yeah. worry about him getting in the portal. Yeah. I don't think his brother's going to come here and then he's going to up and leave. So, yeah. you know, Aloy's frustrating. Um, I love I love Vahiva. But, you know, I mean, boy, he just – it just I always say a swinging bat's a dangerous bat. Boy, he swings it. I think, uh, you know, but he is a force at the plate. What are the other roster needs? Okay, I mean, obviously so they need they need position players because they're they're losing a lot of their starters. Okay, so this is probably where I I differ with a lot of people. You know, pitching and defense. We're pitching and defense wins. Pitching defense wins. I still say. Good hitting can beat good pitching with the right approach, and and I was just I was just curious. I went through I went through some of the, you know, some of the teams that are in the College World Series, your SEC teams. Now, Florida, we hit two seventy one as a team. Florida hit two seventy two as a team. They hit one hundred thirty one home runs. We hit eighty seven home runs. They hit one hundred nine doubles. Uh, we hit ninety three doubles. Uh, they scored. 436 runs, we scored 401. Now, you you take that out and you look at like A&M. They hit 300 as a team, 132 home runs, 123 doubles. They scored 546 runs. Uh, Tennessee, 310 as a team, 173 home runs, 150 doubles, 617 runs as a team. Um, Kentucky, not as many home runs, 84 home runs, a lot of doubles, a lot of runs scored, 287 as a team. On stolen bases. A lot of stolen. I see, I didn't even get into the stolen bases. I mean, I could have I mean, I could have gone through like every stat. Mm-hmm. I just wanted to go over the main one. I didn't go over slugging percentage, um, you know, uh, OPS. I didn't go over all that. I was just looking at the main thing that, you know, now you can get really into the weeds and break it down. But if you look at, like, look at A&M's roster, they got to – they got, this is home runs hit by specific players, 28, 27, 22, 10, 10, 9, 8. Mm-hmm. We had one guy in double digits in home runs. Now, it's not about home runs. I mean, doubles turn into home runs. You miss hit a double, it's a home run. Mm-hmm. We had 14. We had 9, 9, 9, 8, 8, 7, 9. Look at the 2018 Razorback team. 14 home runs, 14 home runs, 13, 13, 10, 9, and 7. That's a pretty balanced lineup right there with a threat all the way up and down. I'm not saying we didn't have threats. We had threats in the lineup. We just didn't drive the ball. Like I don't think we scored enough runs. Um, where you look at all the teams, I mean, they're offensive. They're they're scoring runs, man. It goes back to the stress on the pitchers. Mm-hmm. At the end of the season, I think it it helps to know that, hey, you know, I've got a 33. This guy's hitting 33 home runs. This is hitting 20. He's hitting 16. He's hitting 15, 14, 13, 12. That's Florida's lineup right there. That's how many home runs they hit. Um, I think you've got to have those big boppers in the lineup. I know I really was long-winded with that answer. But 
to I think we need to get more offensive. And mm. and I think DVH were talked about it in the post game, yeah, getting more athletic. More athletes. I think we need a mix of speed and power, and that's hard. People don't understand how hard it is to find a mixture of speed and power. It is. I mean, it really is. Now, Aloy, crazy power, you know. Um, problem is with Vahavi, he's got to stay in the zone a little bit more. Mm-hmm. I think good pitching, you know. Now, if you make a mistake to him, he's going to hit it 400 feet. But if you execute your pitch, you're going to get a chase. Now, he showed signs of laying off those sliders away. But, you know, you look at Simo, he did chase a curveball down. He swung one fastball over his head. I think Wilma was just had him baffled with that. You know, he would tunnel that high fastball off the, the breaking ball. And, mm-hmm. you know, everything, and when it's coming in 60-something miles an hour, it looks this big around. So, but in my opinion, I've looked at the teams the last several years that have gone there. They're teams that don't strike out, whether you're talking Major League Baseball or college baseball. They're teams that don't strike out. Uh, they hit a lot of doubles. They hit some home runs. Uh, they put pressure on the pitcher up and down the lineup. That, it, that's just me. I might totally – DVH might totally agree, disagree with me. Mm-hmm. I just think that's where we need to go. We need to get – and we lost some dudes in the draft last year that would have bolstered these numbers. Right. And I'm not knocking a single player. Look, I said all year, I thought this was a special lineup. We found a way to win, and good teams find a way to win. I think that's a tribute to the coaching staff and the players. But we got to get better. Yeah, That's – that's the answer to your question. I know that probably took – I don't even know how long I just ranted right there. But, <laughs> Looking um. at your imaginary watch. <laughs> yeah, it was uh, – I mean, and then I was going to ask you about better athletes, but I think you, you, you covered that there just in terms of what you think Van Horn means by better athletes. Okay, now one more thing on that. Look at Souza, ridiculous athlete. I mean, mm-hmm. the guy – I think he – I think in two years, scouts are going to be all over him. Mm-hmm. Ryder Helfrich. Love Ryder, a phenomenal athlete. Does not neither one of those guys look like freshmen. They don't hit the ball like freshmen. Now, I think Ryder's got it. If I was Ryder, you know, people talk about going off and getting at bats. I'd stay here and and work on getting stronger. Not that he needs a lot of strength, but mm-hmm. working strong and simplifying the swing. There's way too many moving parts in in Ryder's swing. I mean, I I I love hitting. I love hitting mechanics. I love hitting approach. The whole art of hitting a baseball, I love. I could talk to you about it. We could do a podcast for well, – I could talk 24 <laughs> hours on it. I love it. I, I just think that um, – one thing I was talking to Phil about, I was going over Ben Attendee's numbers. In 2014, he hit 276 with one home run. Now, he wasn't healthy the whole year. Had, had a hammock problem. Yep. Yeah. Um, stayed here, got stronger, simplified his swing. If you look at his swing – mechanically from 2014 to 2015 he totally transformed his swing simplified it Mm -hmm. um i loved his swing in 2015 if you watch him hit that's what i believe in as a hitter he hit 376 or 20 home runs and then everything else we know what he did um but he stayed here and worked on his swing and getting stronger real quick arkansas is going to be at the um to the, before 2025 real quick uh, it's gonna be a 16 team conference you got texas and ou coming in Still some question about whether or not David Pierce is going to be at Texas. Uh, there's some thought that they may make a change uh, at, at their head coaching position. And because it's Texas and because of the money they can throw around, that could create an interesting domino effect uh, within college baseball, if not in the SEC. Uh, you look at Arkansas' schedule next year, we don't know what SEC teams they're going to play. Um, I have heard that Texas and Tennessee might be on the schedule. Uh, there was a little bit of a hint of that uh, at, at one of the swatters clubs this year. I think Van Horn said something about you know, there'll be there'll be a team in orange or, or something like that. Right. Uh, you know, but I, I I can't remember exactly how that went down. But uh, you know, we don't know the schedule. It's going to be a a, a a new way of of looking at things next year because the divisions are going to be gone. You're going to be playing two teams permanently every year. Arkansas is going to be playing Ole Miss and Missouri every year. Uh, I guess they're probably going to like the fact they're playing Missouri every year because unless Missouri really reinvest in, in <laughs> baseball, I don't see Missouri getting out of the cellar anytime soon, especially not when you add two more powerhouses right. um, to the league. Um, just your thoughts on on what 2025 looks like. Overview. I will say this real quick. We talked about Florida's pitching. a <laughs> and has got a ton of hitters coming back. Yeah. They get Laviolette back. They get Grohovac back. Uh, I saw yesterday they just got the Ivy League Player of the Year who hit like 23 home runs this season. He's going there. Uh, they look like they could be a, a real 
team to to reckon with next year. So I don't know the Ivy League player of the year, but I'll look at it as that's the Ivy League player. Well, we got of the Jackson year. Appel then from the Ivy well, League. Yeah, he's been pretty darn good. <laughs> you're right. You're right. So it's I mean, worked for him. I, I always look at these guys and I'm saying, okay. Yeah, he had a great year, and there's some. I'm, I'm not just. I'm not knocking other leagues. There's great players all over college baseball right now. But until someone comes to the SEC and does it, I I really want to see them do it in the SEC. Yeah. Um, I don't like the fact the the, the division thing. I I don't like that. I I like I like having the divisions. I mm-hmm. like having the West. I like mm-hmm. having balance in your scheduling. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I feel like you lose that. And, and there's a way they actually could have done this this year without doing the you know two permanent, eight rotating, where they could have balanced the schedules out a little bit more. But but I digress. <laughs> yeah, we could, could talk you a could long have gone, day. You could have gone to what's a 5-5-5 <laughs> a five, five, five model where you have five right. permanents, five rotating, yeah. and, and I think it would have made, made it a little bit better. But, you know, I do too. Whatever. I know. I think that would be, that'd be awesome because there's something about having your division <clears throat> and winning your division mm-hmm. – you know, it's just it. I don't know, it just makes it mean more. It makes every weekend, you know, where you get to the end of the season. What are you playing for if you're one of the the seller teams? I it's mean, gonna it's gonna make it's gonna make the SEC champion. I think maybe a little bit less, not less recognizable is not the right word. I, I don't know what word I'm looking for here, but basically, I, I think it's going to create a, a thing where an SEC champion can can become the champion. Because they they got to play these three teams, while the team that was their best challenger got to play had to play these three teams, and it, it's not a, a real even schedule that we're looking at. Okay, so you look at we've won the SEC West five out of six years, mm-hmm. and yet when you I didn't get on social media for for a few for a few days. <laughs> By the way, someone someone misquoted me some some jack wagon was it me. No, he said that I said something about us hitting 176 as a team in oh, the yeah. postseason. I, I did I, not I say that. I, I I hope this idiot's listening. <laughs> don't misquote me. If you're going to quote me, get it right. I don't know where he's, what he's referring to. I've never said those numbers in my life because th- they're not even close to being realistic. Mm-hmm. But anyway, I don't want to get off on that. But um, I, I lost I lost my train of thought here. But you're, you're okay, no, the, the the SEC the SEC West we've won it five out of six years yeah. yet. You you look at all the negativity, Matt, of all the people. Everyone is so like they're you know fire DVH, fire Nate Thompson, do this, do that. What if in football we won the SEC West five out of six years, you know? Would and then we lo- lose they a build bowl a game. palace for yeah. Sam Pittman. <laughs> I mean, That's what they would do. <laughs> but you lose your bowl game. Yeah. But you're winning the SEC West five out of six years. Yeah. I mean, it's incredible what. What these teams have done it goes back and, to the and, randomness of the postseason. Yeah, I mean, it's people don't realize how hard it is to get to Omaha. I mean, it is. I mean, look, it's kind of like the discussion we've we've had before. I didn't mean to cut you off. But, no, you're good. But would you rather win a national championship and be irrelevant for two or three years, or be in the discussion every year and maybe not win that last game? Hey, I'd rather be Razorbacks, Razorback baseball, right here. Yeah, Ole Miss. Won a national championship, but they've they haven't they've been crappy ever since. You know, I mean, Mississippi they've State struggled. had two horrible years. Yeah, after they won. yeah. I mean, I mean, I wouldn't trade what we have here because we're we're going to get there. I mean, we are going to get there. I think things just have to. So many things have to happen, and you know, I say it all the time: best team doesn't always win. The team that plays the best. K State played the best this this weekend. Now, if we put K State in the SEC, they'd have finished down low in the SEC. Mm-hmm. We put them in SEC West, probably finished last, don't you think? Uh, yes. <laughs> I, I think that's – maybe they, maybe they beat Auburn. They, maybe. <laughs> I, I still think Auburn was good. I think they underachieved. I'm, that's another team I looked at. I'm like, how are they not winning? Yeah. Now, Mizzou, bad team. Ole Miss, bad. They weren't, Ole Miss was bad this year. You know, it's just it's hard to win a championship. Look, look at some of the Florida State's in Omaha. They've been there twenty four times and they've never won a national championship. That just yeah. kind of speaks yeah. to uh, all of that. North Carolina, it's their twelfth time being there, and, and and you can go on and on. A lot of great programs that are up there this week, looking for their first national championship. Real real quick, Arkansas is going to play at Globe Life next year. They're going to play TCU and Michigan for sure. Georgia's there. I don't. I would be surprised if Arkansas ends up playing Georgia in a, right. a non conference game that early in the season. Um, I saw some this year. There were some instances like that where they had two teams from the same conference there, 
and you just ended up playing one team twice and the other team once and you didn't play the team from your conference. So, uh, you know, maybe that's what happens up there with Arkansas goes to Arlington next year, February 21st to 23rd, opening day next year is on Valentine's Day. Awesome. So countdown is countdown is on. How's that going to affect recruiting? Texas coming to the SEC. Are we going to lose some of our Texas players? Uh, I would be surprised. I'd, I'd be surprised if that happens. Yeah. Everybody was afraid Arkansas would lose out on Texas players when A&M came into the league, and it, I, I don't yeah. think it's really affected their Texas recruiting at all. They've, no. they've gotten some really good players from down yeah. in Texas. Well, so, wouldn't you rather play here? Including than... Jason Jones, who's yeah. one that, you know, I mean, does he transfer? Does he stay in? There's all kinds of questions like this, I yeah. think, uh, that, that have got to be addressed over the off season. So we appreciate you being with us throughout the year here on the Whole Hog Baseball Podcast. I know Bubba and I are already looking forward to doing this again next year. Hope you come to wholehogsports.com throughout the off season. We'll have all kinds of baseball coverage for you on our website, including when fall ball starts up in September. Thank you for being with us. Thanks to Kendall King, where their design talents are showcased by teamwork. Kendall King, Shop Cart, and Soapbox. They're your design professionals with home run stats.